Hey everybody, welcome to this week's roundup. I'm really glad everybody that uh, commented voted to have the intro back because I like saying hi to everybody. So honest truth though, last week I messed up something in the intro and didn't realize it until late at night. So I ended up just deleting the intro, re-uploading the video without it, and then asking, hey, how do you all like it without the intro? So, uh, you know, that was a mistake and that I wanted to turn into a trial run, but I, I like saying hello to everybody. I know it's weird. Maybe I'm just old and, and stuck in my ways, but I'd much rather take like 10 seconds to say hello rather than jump right into it. So I'm going to keep doing it. I'm glad you all agree, but enough rambling. Let's jump in and see what's been going on this week. First up, pre-orders are open for a vinyl version of the Suikoden 2 soundtrack. It looks like a bunch of different stores have it for sale for around $40, and some stores have a different special edition than others, but basically, if you're really into this and you're a collector, check all the links, see what's in stock, see what version you like, or if you just really like video game soundtracks on vinyl, pick the store that's closest to you and pick up whatever is still in stock. But all the details, as usual, are right in Crystal's post. The Kunai GC mod chip is now available for sale and in stock at a few different sellers. I have links right in the post for anybody that was interested. And this is the mod chip that Tito from Macho Nacho Productions had showed off a while back that at the time was not available for sale. It was just in its final prototype stages. But this is essentially the same fully functional version, just in a nice manufactured format rather than uh, rather than some of the different versions that Tito had shown. But functionality is the same. Installation should be the same. And really, it's up to you if you want to decide what version of Homebrew Boot you want to do on your GameCube. You could use the Kunai, you could use the Pico Boot that was showed off a while back that I also did a long live stream trying to install one in one of my GameCubes. But you could also try to find an action replay, which are getting more expensive these days. But if you needed to keep it all stock, you could certainly do that and boot from a SD loader. Uh, you could try to find a game exploit for a game that would be able to uh, to access that and use that. There's just a million, and of course the GC loader, sorry, there's a, a million different ways to load homebrew on your GameCube now, but it's my very strong opinion that even if you are the type of person that only uses original discs, you still would want to try to load homebrew for things like Game Boy Interface and of course Swiss, because even if you use original discs, you could still do things like set video options and a whole bunch of other amazing things with Swiss. So I, I just think that as a lot of these consoles age, adding a mod chip or homebrew abilities to it becomes such a huge part of the experience. So whichever is the easiest for you, whichever you prefer, they're, they're all wins in my opinion. It's just whatever's better for your setup, but I would seriously consider one because there's you could just you could unlock quite a bit of power and a lot of options from your GameCube by running Swiss and you need a, a way to boot homebrew to do so. Uh, so any questions at all about this, I would strongly recommend just rewatching Tito's video because he nailed everything in that and links to all of that are right here in the post. The YouTube channel Cinemax recently posted a video that broke down how the audio samples in Castlevania Symphony of the Night work. And just a quick reminder, while yes, PlayStation had CD quality audio, that was for the soundtracks. All of the different samples and sound effects and stuff were still generated on chips, just like other video game consoles of the era. And the channel broke down how all of those worked and also why they were different in the PSP version of Symphony of the Night. And I thought this one was absolutely awesome. And Chris from Displaced Gamers wrote up the post here on Retro RGB. And if uh, if you get through this video, you could immediately see why that resonated with Chris, because it's a very Displaced Gamers style video of doing things. But I, I was really fascinating. And, and I honestly, while I know how samples work and while I kind of understood how it was working in these older consoles, I wasn't ever really sure how they handled that in ports. So this kind of describes that with a lot of very good examples. And don't let any of the code intimidate you. If you're not a programmer like me, you could still watch this entire video and be able to actually hear the differences. And I don't mean hear the differences with headphones and a super nice stereo. I mean, crappy flat panel TV speakers, you'd still be able to hear the difference. So if you're even remotely interested in how audio sounds work and you know, any kind of effects in video games, this is a really good idea of how they might differ between consoles. And uh, it certainly explains why the sound effects are different in the PSP and PlayStation version of Symphony of the Night. 
Some more pretty amazing news for non-Japanese speaking fans of the Sega Saturn. The game Stellar Assault just had full English localizations of the voice acting posted. And this is the same team that did the Bulk Slash fan translation, which, if anyone remembers, was just absolutely phenomenal. Just really top tier. All the team members did such a good job. My respect to everybody involved in that project and now this one as well. The game is kind of like a Star Fox-like space mission game, and while a lot of the game has been playable for non-Japanese speaking and reading audiences for a while, um, some of it was translated, you could probably get through most of the game without it, but now all of the spoken dialogue has been translated as well, so you could really get a better sense of what's going on in the game. Um, right here in the post from the Shiro crew is a lot of details, including links to everything, and they even did a full playthrough or a long playthrough of it, which if you want to really see it, the game in action, that's definitely a good way to do it. But honestly, I say this every time. I know everybody might be annoyed with me for just saying it, but I genuinely mean it. Thank you to anybody who does translations of games, because it's just, it's so unbelievably awesome that people get to try these games for the first time, if you will, because, you know, while some of these games were definitely playable, some of them also had deep stories in them, so you didn't really know what it is that you were doing, which is fine for certain games, but for others, the story is a big part of it. So this is absolutely awesome. I cannot wait to try it out myself, but for now, if you want your fix of it, just check out the Shiro stream on it. Everything is linked right here in the post. But once again, thank you to everybody from the bulk slash fan translation team who also worked on this. And of course, the Shiro crew, because they're all awesome. Wobbling Pixels just released an awesome video that walks you through everything it takes to clean up your Wii's video output. And some things are actual fixes for problems like the 480p bug that should have never existed. And other things are more preference-based like uh, removing certain post-processing filters and other things I personally would consider a fix depending on how you're using it. So I think a perfect example is the deflicker filter. So if you're using like composite video on a consumer grade CRT, then just leave it alone. It's probably fine. But if you're using quality output on a flat panel or you're running in 480p, I think most of that stuff just dirties up the image. And also we're talking about filters and smoothing that were built into a 20 something year old console that was very underpowered at the time. I think everybody kind of agreed on that one. Not saying the Wii isn't awesome, but it didn't have the most powerful chips in that. So doing something like turning off all of this extra processing and then using some high quality HD retrovision component cables to go into like a RetroTank 5X and using its processing might get you better results. Now, this is something that you're going to have to mess with on a case-by-case -case basis, but no hardware mods are required for this. You do need a way to boot Wii Homebrew, so I actually think pretty much every Wii out there has the Homebrew channel installed on it. Even if you don't play backups, even if you play original discs, booting into the Homebrew channel and uh, launching it through the different kind of game launchers they have would allow a lot of these options. So if you're a fan of the Wii and you really want to see what could be done, I would absolutely check this out because there's just so many very cool options. And what I would also really like to see is what happens if you take the Wii's image and get it into your Tink 5X and then put that through, yes, I'm going to say it, the M cable and maybe even the uh, the 4K Gamer Pro. What do those things look like? How do, how do those increase the sharpness or the smoothing? And that's really something that I think might really need an entirely other video. Maybe Wobbling Pixels would be up to that, but, you know, I genuinely have almost never found a good use for the M cable. I mostly find it to be snake oil, especially their marketing, but I have absolutely found scenarios which I thought it was awesome. Worth a hundred bucks for those few scenarios, that's totally up to you. It definitely doesn't add lag, so you feel free to try, but... Seeing Amped 2 on the Xbox and 720p run through the M cable and classic whatever with its smoothing really did impress me, genuinely, and I've never said otherwise. But most of the other times it kind of just hasn't and introduced more weird artifacts than it kind of helped. 
but I'd love to try it with this, you know, turning off all softening and filtering, getting the sharpest image possible, and then running that through the M cable. What does that look like? Or through the that sharpening filter on the 4K Gamer Pro? Or what might stuff look like like this look like when the eventual release of the RetroTINK 4K comes out? I don't know. But what I do know is if you're a fan of the Wii and these weird effects bug you like they do most of us, most people listening to this podcast anyway, uh, it would be worth taking your time to just if, especially if you already have a soft modded Wii, to just try some of these out and see what you think. And my guess, my gut feeling is that sometimes you're going to like it just the way it is. It's going to be, or sometimes the least worst of is going to be leaving it alone. And sometimes, depending on the game and the display, turning off everything like Wobbling Pixel showed is going to be the way that you prefer to play it. But there's no wrong answer in this one. It's ha- however you like to see it. And uh, if you can't tell the difference, that's fine too. But uh, this is just one of these videos that's worth watching because you can't lose. I recently did an interview with Wendell from the channel Level One Tex, and I had an absolute blast talking with him. I'll be honest, I don't have time to watch much YouTube. I try to. And when I had the Thunderbolt issue, a bunch of different people who I trust, who are smart people, said, you got to talk to Wendell from Level One Tex. So I checked out the channel. I subscribed. The videos seemed good. The channel seemed solid. But after talking to Wendell, I'm I'm hooked. I've already so signed up on support services, and now I'm officially a fan. Uh, it was just a great conversation that covered PCs and just random tech stuff. And I really think the core retro RGB audience would absolutely be interested to hear what Wendell has to say. Even though it's not really retro gaming focused, I just I think if you want a a fun nerdversation, like I, I know I'm such a dork. I don't care. I like it. Whatever. But if you if you want to hear two nerds talking about stuff that our our fellow nerds would really enjoy, I strongly recommend listening to this one. And there's definitely going to be a follow up at some point. One that uh, anything that that kind of just flowed that smoothly. There's got to be a second one at some point. So check this one out. As always, they're available everywhere you could find podcasts. This is a video podcast, but whatever app you normally use, just search for Retro RGB Wendell, and this one will pop right up. Um, and while it's always nice to see it hits on the videos, I genuinely don't care where you listen to it. I'm just very happy that you do. So check it out where wherever is the most easy for you. And definitely check out their channel and their store as well. They have a bunch of pretty fun t-shirts and mugs and stuff, and I'm going to end up buying at least one of them soon. So definitely check out all their stuff too. Next up, Stone Age Gamer is now selling Humble Bazooka's 3D printed replacement shell for the RGB blaster. So if you've already bought your RGB blaster directly from Stone Age Gamer, it comes in a really nice case, as well as this exact shell that you're seeing. However, if you picked one up from Crix and you just think, hey, that's a really nice case, I would like to have one of those, they are selling the shell separately, which I think is great. They're not pulling any of that. You have to buy the full package in order to get it thing. They, they just want to sell cool stuff to fun retro gaming nerds. So props to, to Stone Age Gamer for selling these. Thank you to Humble Bazooka for making them. And it's only 15 bucks and they come in currently six different colors. And I got the red one and had it plugged into my Famicom and it matched perfectly. I have a YouTube short as well as a video on every social media platform that just shows the very basics on how to assemble it. It's as easy as you could imagine. Um, But if you were looking to get one of these, definitely pick it up. And if you don't know what the RGB blaster is, it's a zero latency plug and play device that gets RGB from top loading Famicoms and a top loading NES via a converter, and it uses a Genesis 2 port. So it's RGB only, but it'll work with every single Genesis 2 RGB cable, including HD retrovision and all that stuff. Um, There's still some firmware issues that need ironing out, but overall, I love it. I just think it's absolutely awesome. And if you want more info on all of this stuff, this one post has the two shorts I did that really just tell you everything you need to know about this thing. So links are right here in the post if you're interested. And if you already own one, I mean, it works perfect. You certainly don't need a shell, but it looks cool. Now it's time for this week's Mr. Updates, Care of Lou from Lou's Retro Source. As usual, I'm just going to skim through all of these, and if you hear anything that piques your interest, please go back and watch Lou's video for all of the details, or just go watch Lou's video and skip the rest of this podcast anyway. (laughs) First up, Jimmy Stones created a few initial builds of the core for the game Juno First from Konami, and it's glitchy, but if you wanted to try it out, it's available. 
Also, SRG320 announced some new updates to the Saturn core, which affect a bunch of different games, including Sonic Jam and OutRun Japan. And the Japanese OutRun on the Saturn is the one that could do 60 frames per second, which if you're a fan of the game, it's worth seeing. I actually, I kind of think I prefer the original just because that's how I've been playing it since I was, I don't know, almost born pretty much uh but you know it's really awesome to check out so if you want an unstable build download it give it a try and just kind of see what that's like next up um lou went and highlighted a bunch of tools that were by the developer wizzo and i don't want to take away from lou's video go check it out if you want to see where all these different tools are but i will say that i use a bunch of them i'm a huge fan of wizzo's work and hopefully i will have a chance to have a chat with him here on the podcast at some point but i'm also a fan of these and really think you should take a look at them because as i've shown with those tools before in that last arcade focused video i did they they just make my overall mr workflow a lot smoother on those arcade machines and probably on your on your normal setup as well next robert had showed off a bunch more updates to the software emulator for the n64 core and just once again not to sound like a broken record but the software emulator that robert has written is for development purposes it's not designed to play games in real time but it is designed to try and test out how much of this could actually run on the de 10 nano and robert even wrote a completely different uh piece of software that helps you test speed i believe in the ddr3 memory so if you wanted to test any of this stuff awesome but really it's just an update saying the n64 core is still possible but there's nothing actually running on the mister yet but we all have faith that robert's going to do his best and i'm excited to see where he goes with it um, also, the Toa Plan 1 core is being revisited. Rally Bike is now getting past the post check, and a CPU used for uh, sound on Demon's World is being worked on, so there's still hope for that core to be implemented. Um, Anton Gale is continuing working on the Taito System SJ core, which will run elevator action, and is making a bit of progress. Also, Hotego just released a beta for the Aliens arcade game by Konami, which is a fun game, and this core also supports Super Contra, Thunder Cross, and Gangbusters. And as usual, if you are a beta tester of Hotego, so if you sign up for the Patreon, you can get access to this immediately. And if you're not, you could just wait till it goes public and get it completely for free. I am a fan of this because I, I think there's a lot of good that comes out of it, but you know what? If, if you don't like any of these beta subscription models, go on the internet and talk about it. Uh, and also speaking of which the New Zealand store, the JT Kiwi core that has, that offers the game New Zealand story and a bunch of others is now no longer in beta testing. So just use your favorite updater in order to get it. That's all you have to do. Um, also, Darren O has released a core for Jalico's arcade game Rodland. All you have to do to obtain the core is enable the CoinOp collection database in the update all script. Also, for the Williams Y unit and Z unit core, Pramod has resolved all timing issues with the CPU, and the core is finally booting on Mister. It's glitchy, but it actually boots, and that's important because at least from there, Pramod could work out issues in simulation, and that means that games like Mortal Kombat might be coming to the Mister at some point, which I'm obviously ecstatic about. Um, and there's also been a couple of other updates for Linux, Game Boy, PCXT, and the IRM M92 core. So if you want any more updates on this, please check out Lou's video. And thanks so much to Lou because as there's no way I could keep up with all of this without him. So much appreciated, and uh, please make sure to subscribe to Lou as well. Well, that's it for this week. As usual, I just want to end by thanking everybody who supports in absolutely any way possible, because honestly, you are the sponsors of this podcast and the website. Without your support, none of this would happen. So all the people who support monthly are really the core group keeping this all going, but just simply going to retrorgb.com forward slash support, clicking on either the Amazon or eBay link, and then buying anything else that you were going to buy anyway, which is now the same price, also helps the channel massively. And I think that one might be easier for a lot of other people because anything, a video game, toothpaste, whatever, <laughs> just click on that Amazon link first or, or maybe right before you go to check out and you could support that way as well. Because while I'm always trying to get sponsors in that I feel like are actual 
good fits for the channel. It is really you who are the sponsor. So I just wanted to once again and always thank you. Even if you're bored of hearing me say it, I'll never stop saying thank you to everybody who really deserves it. So thank everybody who supports. Thanks everybody who watches, who listens, plays nicely in the comments, and really just you're all awesome. And I will see you all next week. Thank <laughs> you.